Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today we have another installment of going through old newspapers, which has pretty much become my favorite pastime. I don't even know how to describe it. It's just so immersive and it allows you to step into history in a way that's not really that easy through other mediums. Our newspaper today comes from Boston, Massachusetts, the Columbian Sentinel. The date is Saturday, May 14th, 1791. 1791 and I'm holding it in my hands that's cool just like last time as I go through it I'm going to put the excerpts on screen as always don't forget to check the video description for plenty of links other bits of backstory here and there and without any further ado let's get started the very first thing on this newspaper it comes from the American Museum I looked that up you can find a link in the video description. So this is something that was written, printed elsewhere, and it got printed in this newspaper as well. I cannot for the life of me figure out who wrote it. It is signed with an X at the end. I would love to find out anything else they've written because this is a jolly good ride. I'm going to read this now in my best reading voice for you, and uh, I'll put it up on the screen. <coughs> great good thoughts on great good breeding. It is certainly a matter of no trifling importance to every man, be his situation or rank in society what it may, to be esteemed well-bred. This being conceded, I shall, without further apology, lay down a few rules which, if properly attended to, cannot fail of proving serviceable to the young scholar or tinseled beau. In the first place, my pupil must provide himself with a large stock of real, unaffected impudence which he must carry with him wherever he goes and liberally use upon all occasions. Like an Aegis, it will shield him from the attacks of his enemies, it will enable him to perform wonders, and without its sovereign aid, in vain will he seek for admiration, in vain will he attempt to exhibit good breeding. It is by no means necessary that his mental powers be highly cultivated, or that his pericranium be crammed with that outlandish kind of stuff vulgarly called useful knowledge. Let others of less consequence lumber their brains with the spurious trash. Great and well-bred spirits need not such paltry assistance. Self-exaltation is enough for them. This alone will furnish them with all the advantages of both merit and extensive knowledge without subjecting them to their numberless inconveniences. Is a man really meritorious and well-informed? The shafts of envy are perpetually leveled at him and mar his happiness. Is he so only in his own conceit? No one envies him and he lives in peace. As conscience will only be a stumbling block in his way, it will be best for him to dispose of it whenever a generous price is offered. He must be well versed in all fashionable pastimes and especially in the polite arts of swearing, drinking to excess, gambling, etc., so that he may not appear vulgar or awkward in his deportment. He should likewise be practiced in the most approved and general methods of fighting duels, that should his life at any time become irksome, he may know how to make his exit with elegance and dispatch by the help of a sword, a pair of pistols, or a halter. My pupil, for his better accomplishment, will likewise attend to the following remarks and form himself upon the model of character which they define. I have been in company with some good-natured people who have an admirable way of saving one the trouble of proceeding in a story by undertaking to furnish the audience with the remainder of it as soon as a person has made a beginning. Now this is true urbanity and certainly proceeds from a desire of being serviceable. I wish, however, that the kind folks would extend their goodness a little further and let us know beforehand when they mean to assist us, as it might save one many an unruly blush and hard thought. I hope my pupil may profit by these remarks, but at the same time I advise him by no means to retract a tittle from anything he advances in conversation. I remember to have heard of a general who acquired great reputation from never countermanding an order that he had once given, because whenever a commanding officer does this, his troops lose all faith and confidence in him. It has this other advantage, that if he persists in his argument, backs it with the force of strong vociferation and engrosses all the talk, he necessarily prevents an antagonist from a possibility of replying. And until an argument is replied to, it always stands good. 
He must despise punctuality as beneath his dignity. And although he pledges his word over and over again, it is little, it is meanness to comply with it. Words were made for men, not men for words. It is therefore inverting the laws of nature and of order to be fettered by a promise. And we must make others feel our consequence if we ever mean to convince them that we are truly great. Besides, it is noble to be free, and that he that voluntarily shackles his mind, his body, or his actions honestly deserves to be a slave. I hope it will not be unproductive of benefit if I now take the liberty to introduce my young pupil to a knowledge of the character of Mr. Nincom Littlebrains, a pert dealer in cent per cents who, in addition to a thorough practice in all the above-mentioned excellent rules, exhibits other surprising marks of great good breeding. He is dictatorial, dogmatical, and impervious to a nicety. His favorite topic of conversation is his own dear self, and he often delights and improves others by assuring them that he has such near intimacy and connection with all the great men in office that they repose so much unbounded confidence in him, and pay such a deference to his opinions and superior abilities that a stranger would be led to think that Congress dare not pass a single law without previously consulting him. He speaks in raptures of his present and high consequence and prospects of future opulence and grandeur. In company, he monopolizes the whole of the conversation, unless someone now and then happens to force a word in when he stops to take a breath. It is really pleasing to hear him tell of the many terrible and marvelous exploits that he could perform if he were so disposed, and of the mighty multitude of mighty things which he has seen and done and which nobody else ever saw done or heard of before. Whenever his invention grows weary and fails to supply him with a fresh water on his head, he postpones the further consideration of these subjects until he has leisure to manufacture a better assortment. Mr. Nincom Littlebrains has another trait in his character equally charming with the rest. He is remarkably fond of displaying his oratorial abilities and in this way often spends the whole force of his artillery in violent attacks of contempt and ridicule upon religion and religion's votaries. This he does in the most masterly manners, always mimicking the ministers of God and exclaiming eloquently against the scriptures. It is in vain to discover any symptoms of being tired with his perpetual clatter. Something must be said. And I verily believe he would sooner burst his lungs than be silent for a moment. When he is in good glee for troping, for he judges naturally enough that as it is extremely agreeable to himself to run on in this way, it must be equally entertaining to his hearers. Besides which, he is fully persuaded of the impossibility of his reaping any benefit from the observations of others, because he knows more than all the world besides. I have been told, but cannot vouch for the authenticity of the report that Mr. Nincom Littlebrains, our well-bred hero, means to wear a bishop in future. For the haughty and disdainful manner with which he treats everybody has sometimes induced surly, unpolished fellows to retort on him in a rather too rough and indelicate way. Nincom is therefore of the opinion that a bishop would be an excellent defense to a tender part against the rude and disgraceful attacks of ill-bred feet. This is the greatest thing I've ever read. Now you can see why I really wanted to find out who wrote this because this is such great satire. It is so funny, it's so clever. The whole thing is an instruction to a pupil on how to be, how to exhibit great good breeding. But all of the instructions are on the worst possible things to do. You know, the person who monopolizes the conversation, the person who jumps in and tries to finish a story first, those are the worst types of people. And even in 1791, those were the worst types of people. I wish I could go back in time and tell the writer of this, you are going to make someone laugh hundreds of years in the future with this. It's just, it's just so great. It's so interesting to see satire from so long ago. And like I said, the name Mr. Nincom Littlebrains. Instant classic. I knew I had to do something with that name. So if you're interested in buying Nincom Littlebrains merch, look in the video description. I designed this notebook because I thought it would be hilarious to have a notebook that looks like it belongs to Mr. Nincom Littlebrains and what would be within? Great good thoughts. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did. I thought that was fantastic. Moving on. Up next, we have something really cool, which is an excerpt from Thomas Paine's Rights of Man. 
Now, Thomas Paine is, of course, very famous for his pamphlet in 1776, Common Sense, which is credited with helping spur on the popular opinion of breaking away from Britain. This is an excerpt from Rights of Man, which was published in 1791 in response to Edmund Burke's pamphlet, Reflections on the Revolution in France, published in 1790. In Burke's pamphlet, he presents arguments against the French Revolution, what's been going on, whereas Thomas Paine in Rights of Man is arguing for the revolution and everything that's happening. What's printed in this newspaper isn't the full Rights of Man, it's an excerpt. Even here at the top, there's a disclaimer from the newspaper people saying that Thomas Paine presented such beautiful arguments, such fantastic stuff, that it was almost impossible to make a selection. But here we are. I'll just read a couple of paragraphs, and I'm going to put links to the full text of both Edmund Burke's pamphlet and Thomas Paine's Rights of Man in the video description if you're interested. But there are many points of view in which this revolution may be considered. When despotism has established itself for ages in a country, as in France, it is not in the person of the king only that it resides. It has the appearance of being so in show and in nominal authority, but it is not so in practice and fact. It was not against Louis XVI, but against the despotic principles of the government that the nation revolted. These principles had not their origin in him, but in the original establishment many centuries back, and they were become too deeply rooted to be removed. And the Augean stable of parasites and plunderers too abominably filthy to be cleansed by anything short of a complete and universal revolution. Marquis de Lafayette went to America at an early period of the war and continued a volunteer in her service to the end. When this address came to the hands of Dr. Franklin, who was then in France, he applied to Count Vergen to have it inserted in the French Gazette, but never could obtain his consent. Okay. Not only do we have Thomas Paine writing about the French Revolution, he mentions Louis XVI and the Marquis de Lafayette and Benjamin Franklin. When I tell you I am starstruck. <laughs> Again, this is 1791 that this was written. The following year in 1792, the French monarchy would be formally abolished. And in 1793, both Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette would be executed. And then, of course, what followed was known as the Reign of Terror. So at the time of writing, things had not become as violent as we would eventually come to know the French Revolution to be. Here we have sent in by Thomas Jefferson, who was at that time Secretary of State for the United States, a decree introducing new flags to be flown by the French Navy. These new flags had been agreed upon in France in October of 1790. And that information, of course, had to be passed along to the United States. Article 1. The jack shall be composed of three equal stripes and placed vertically. The one nearest to the staff shall be red, the center one white, and the third blue. Article 2. The ensign shall bear in its upper quarter the same as the jack above described, that part of the flag shall be exactly one-fourth of its full size and encircled with a narrow stripe, one half the length of which shall be red and the other white. The remainder of the flag shall also be white. This flag shall be borne by ships of war and commercial vessels. Here, that's Article 2 mentioning a border. Article 1 didn't mention a border, but when I was researching this, everything that I saw had a border for just the regular jack. I don't know why, but regardless, I am putting some links in the video description if you want to learn more about French flags. Cool. Next, we have what is sort of some slang. This comes from The Prompter, which I looked up. The Prompter, or a commentary on common sayings and subjects, which are full of common sense, the best sense in the world. <laughs> when a man's name is up, he may lie abed till noon. But the prompter's name is not half up. He can therefore take a short nap only. Our good country folks who talk English when they mean to say a man's fame is spread abroad or his reputation extensively established, say his name is up, or he has got his name up. How blessed is the man who has got his name up. Everybody knows how a certain astronomer got his name up for a great almanac maker by foretelling snow in the month of May. The truth was, in the copy of his almanac, in the month of May there happened to be a blank space. He cast about for something to fill the blank space. Snow was the first word that occurred, and snow was written in the blank. 
heaven, not by accident, for heaven has nothing to do with the capricious things called accidents, heaven had determined that there should be snow that year in May, and snow there was, though the almanac maker had as little foreknowledge of this as his horse block. No sooner did it snow, but all the world looked into the almanac. La, said the world, our almanac tells of snow at this very time. This is a knowing man, he is a genius. What a lucky hit, the man's name was up. No almanac so good as his, and while he continued to make almanacs, Sir Isaac Newton himself would have starved upon almanac making, within the fame of this mighty conjurer whose almanacs, by one mere guess, had got his name up, and drove all competitors from the market. When this was done, he might lie abed till noon. A single blunder before his name was up would have damned his almanacs. Afterwards, fifty errors only gave credit to the work, for, say the world, great men may mistake, but this man's name is up. I have known a man get his name up by curing the belly ache. Excuse me, ladies, for the ladies in Philadelphia of the tip-top fashion call certain rolls of sweet cake by a much less delicate name, with a powder of unknown composition. All at once the doctor is sent for to cure the belly ache. Even the boys who eat green apples must have the belly ache doctor. Skill, science, wisdom, prudence are all prostrated before that doctor and his powder. If his patients die, no matter, his name is up, and he will still have business. I once knew a shopkeeper who got his name up as a cheap trader. He did indeed sell cheap, wondrous cheap, even below first cost. He began to trade with little capital, sold goods for less than he gave, and yet grew rich. How can this be? The proctor thinks it is very easy. That article which everybody wants and knows the value of, sell very low, even lower than first cost. Get your name up, draw all the world to your shop, and then put double profit on other goods. It is very easy and very common. The greatest blockhead can do this and make a fortune. So when a writer gets his name up, he may retail all manner of nonsense and it will find a ready market in public opinion. A good essay appears in the newspaper. Who wrote it? Dr. Franklin, it is said, wrote it. Well, it is like him, it is a masterly production. Sometime after, the real author appears to be a young man who, as the poet says, is unknown to fame, and as I say, whose name is not up. Impossible, he cannot be the author. Who ever heard of him before? I am sure Dr. F or Governor L helped him. In fact, his name is not up. A young lady gets her name up for a beauty or a fortune. All the world are fighting and dying for her. Wit, sense, accomplishments all distinguish her. Bows hang around her like flies about a cask of sugar. Suddenly, she has a fit of sickness. The roses on her cheeks decay. It is discovered she has no fortune. Her admirers draw off. She is a clever girl, but she is not so clever as I thought her. I once knew a very sensible woman who took a great fancy to names. One of her whims was that her daughters should marry names beginning with H. She could give no reason for her inclination but this. She had known several of her neighbors who married men with names beginning with H, and they all made good husbands. They were not the greatest men, she said, but they were kind, good-natured husbands, and would suffer anything rather than to be offended. All the neighborhood were in love with the letter H. Nothing would do for a husband but this letter H which some squeamish grammarians will have to be no letter, but the name of the letter was up. To conclude, a man by the name of Washington some time ago passed through the village where I live. This was soon known. Mr. Washington, what, a relation of the president? This indeed was not known, but everybody really thought he looked a little like the president. All the world collected to get a peep at him as he passed the window of his lodgings. Everybody bowed as he passed. Everybody looked and admired. The man was indeed a very great scoundrel, but he knew human nature. He knew the name of Washington was up. He assumed the name for traveling purposes. The president's real letters of recommendation could not have procured him more respect. When a man's name is up, he may lie abed till noon. This is another example of something that I found to be very cleverly written, and it still holds true today. People can get away with a lot when their name is up. And I love learning 18th century slang. Oh yeah, his name is up. This little bit about Mr. Washington is so funny. 
The guy was a scoundrel, but he knew human nature. He knew that if he walked around calling himself Mr. Washington, people would be bowing down with respect because the name of Washington carries weight, gravity. I couldn't figure out who the almanac maker was. The way that this is written indicates that we all know who he's talking about, but I don't. <laughs> I tried to figure it out. I can't. If anybody knows, please let me know in the comments. I am going to include a link to this text, which I found in the prompter. So if you want to read it for yourself without me reading it to you, there's a link in the video description. I thought this was great. Let's change the battery. Next. Cincinnati. Monday, pursuant to a vote of adjournment passed at the general meeting of the Cincinnati the last year, a number of the delegates from the several states assembled in this city. The president and vice president being absent, the Honorable General Knox was chosen president pro temp. This is referencing the Society of the Cincinnati, which actually still exists today. I'm going to read a little about section on their website. The Society of the Cincinnati is the nation's oldest patriotic organization, founded in 1783 by officers of the Continental Army and their French counterparts who served together in the American Revolution. Its mission is to promote knowledge and appreciation of the achievement of American independence and to foster fellowship among its members. At this time, George Washington was acting as president of the group, and after George Washington died, Alexander Hamilton became president. I couldn't figure out who the vice presidents were, but as it says here, both the president and vice president being absent, the Honorable General Knox became the temporary president just for this meeting. From looking at their website, it looks like it started at as an annual meeting, so once a year, and now present day, it's once every three years on the first Monday in May in Philadelphia. Here it says Monday pursuant to blah, blah, blah. So it's referencing Monday. This was printed on a Saturday. So the Monday it's referencing is Monday, May 2nd, 1791, which is the first Monday in May of that year. So this is really cool to me to see mention of this group that still exists today to be able to cross check the dates and be like, yeah, the Monday that they'd be referencing is the first Monday in May. I just like when things make sense. <laughs> it's cool to know that General Knox got to be the president for that particular meeting. I don't know, just thought it was cool. Thought I'd mention. I'm leaving a link in the video description if you want to look at the society and what it is and does today. Next, we have the vice president of the United States is on a tour to this state where he intends to spend the summer. I don't know why I found this interesting, but I did. The vice president at that time was John Adams. He's actually from Massachusetts. And in 1791, the capital of the United States was in Philadelphia. So this means he was taking a trip from Philadelphia to Massachusetts, where he's from, to spend the summer. The following year, in 1792, the cornerstone of the White House would be Lane Laid in Washington, D.C., and the Capitol wouldn't officially move to D.C. until 1800, and John Adams would be the first president to live in the White House. But at this time, Philadelphia is where he was, and for the summer, he'll be in Massachusetts, in case anyone is looking for him. Next here, it says, died in Virginia of a bite of mad cat, Miss Stanford. That's all it says. So I guess some sort of rabid cat bit Miss Stanford, and she died in 1791. I tried finding a Miss Stanford who died in this area in 1791, and I couldn't find her, but that sucks. I wonder if the cat just randomly attacked her, or if she was, you know, trying to pick it up, or if it was their house cat who caught rabies and infected her. I want to know all of these things. None of this information is provided, but I thought other people might be interested in that as well. Here we have stuff to be sold on State Street. A number of Chaldron's Smith's Coal, 10 chests Sushong tea, a parcel pack saddles and leather straps with buckles, 10 boxes soap, 20 DO, I've just learned a short for ditto, meaning the unit of measurement aforementioned. So 20 boxes chocolate, few hampers, English porter, a parcel coffee mills, copper tea kettles, etc. One of my favorite things to do when looking at these newspapers is to see things that are going on sale, just to know what people were interested in buying. You know, these are things that were advertised as come to my establishment because we have buckles and soap. 
Like, yeah, those would be necessary. Do people advertise buckles anymore? <laughs> I don't know. And below that we have a variety of goods like calicos, chintzes, shawls, lawns, cambrics, men's and women's gloves, gauzes, gauze handkerchiefs, laces, edgings, scotch threads, buttons, buckles, knives, and forks. The list goes on. It's fascinating to me. Imagine reading the newspaper over breakfast and seeing, ooh, they have gauze handkerchiefs, let's go. Shoe buckles, count me in. Next, we have a concert, which I thought was really cool. And if I had all the time and money in the world, I would put together this concert for you guys. I tried to track down all of the songs mentioned. I had some trouble. If you check the video description, I will put all of the information I found. Mr. and Mrs. Solomon, vocal performers from the South Ward, South Ward? have the honor of presenting the ladies and gentlemen of Boston a concert of vocal music of the most fashionable songs and duets. And by the way, if you want to come to the concert on May 16th, tickets cost a half dollar each. So keep that in mind. See you there. Next, we have the scheme of the ninth class of the Massachusetts Monthly State Lottery positively to commence drawing on Thursday the 30th of June next. I couldn't find all that much information on these sorts of monthly lotteries. I imagine it was to fund some sort of project. Just like in the last newspaper, we have more notices for which ships are going where and when, and if you want to apply for passage, this is who you talk to. Now we come to one of my favorite discoveries of this newspaper. <clears throat> Whereas Polly Reed, the wife of me, the subscriber, has behaved in a very indecent manner and has at times squandered away my interest and refused to bed and board with me. This is therefore to forbid any person or persons harboring or trusting her on my account, as I will not pay any debt she may contract after the date of this advertisement. Joshua Reed. This man takes out an ad in the newspaper about this indecent wife of his on the loose with the explicit instructions not to trust her, essentially saying, this isn't my problem anymore. It's really funny. I tried to find out if these two ever reconciled, you know, like if a Polly Reed and a Joshua Reed, maybe they're buried next to each other or anything. I couldn't find anything about them together. I did find a number of Joshua Reeds who were alive during this time, but this isn't an obituary, so I don't know when they died, so I wouldn't be able to say if it's him or not. So I guess we'll never know. Polly Reed, woman on the loose. And now we're on to the back. Down here we have something really, really cool. It says, the subscriber takes leave to inform the citizens of the United States that the Honorable Congress has granted to him the exclusive privilege of building bridges after the manner of that of Charles River Bridge, by connecting the piles together, driving them, and securing the timber from being destroyed by the worms. Any gentleman inclining to promote the building of bridges, etc., may obtain information on the subject by applying to the public's most obedient servant, John Stone. Concord, Massachusetts, May 5th, 1791. Now what's cool about this is that the United States had passed its first patent law in 1790 in order to promote the progress of useful arts. John Stone, the writer of this article, received the sixth ever US patent for pile drivers for bridge building. And here he is telling everyone about it and saying, if you're interested in participating, come to me, I got the patent, let's get to work. I thought that was a really cool find. Up here, I just want to read the first sentence of this. Be it remembered that on the 6th day of November in the 15th year of the independence of the United States of America, it sort of stopped me in my tracks when I read that because it's such an interesting reminder. This is a brand new country and they're still thinking in terms of that. Next, we have a beer brewery. Richard Allen from Old England respectfully informs the public that he has opened his brew house behind Howard's Meeting House in West Boston for brewing strong, keeping beers, fine ales, and ship and small beers. Those who please to favor him with their orders may depend on having beers in as high perfection as any in Europe. I loved the wording of that ad, and I love that there's no address. It literally just says, behind Howard's Meeting House in West Boston. <laughs> I looked this up to try and see, does this place still exist? Is there a record of it? I couldn't find anything. If anybody knows of a beer brewery owned by a Richard Allen, 
And last but not least, we have this ad. Journeymen Weavers. If six or seven good weavers want constant employ, by applying at the Haverhill Manufactory, we'll meet with encouragement equal to any, besides the pleasure of weaving in the new constructed looms, which are so far simplified that by the easy movements of the cloth and yarn beams, lambs, laves, and harnesses, in a few minutes the weaver can trim his loom so as to suit himself, let his size or length of his limbs be what they may, neither does it require half the exertion in making good stout duck in them, I don't know what that means, as is absolutely necessary in the common old-fashioned looms. Two or three apprentices are wanted. Apply as above. I thought this was interesting because in 1791 we are well into the first industrial revolution and I started looking into looms, I know nothing about looms, but I found that this there was a new power loom invented by English inventor Edmund Cartwright in the 1780s, which I believe are the ones being mentioned here, these new types of looms. Or they were modeled after those new power looms. But if anybody has any more information, I am linking to something that I found on this subject. I also don't know what duck means. Beams, lambs, laves, harnesses. These are all foreign words to me, but I thought it was interesting to see this new invention that was being adopted and it's being advertised. Hey, check out this new thing. It's gonna make your life a whole lot easier. You can get a lot more done, come and apply. Just like today, people would have to adopt new technology in the workplace. <sighs> so those are some of the highlights of this beautiful newspaper from 1791, May 14th, 1791. As with the last one, I am willing to part with it. If you are interested in buying it, let me know. Again, please check out all the links in the video description. I found a lot of stuff you may think is interesting. Please let me know in the comments below if you'd like me to continue with these sorts of things, if it interests you as much as it interests me. Please don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and hit subscribe if you haven't already. Share this video with anyone who may find it interesting. And thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time.